Aging, uh, I have to admit that it, it is a scary process for me. Five years ago, I decided I, I refuse to age, I don't want to age. But then I realized that maybe that's a damaging uh, self-talk as well, because mm -hmm. I don't want to age, I do age. What is the right way to age? Should we be trying to resist and hang on to a more youthful, vibrant image of ourselves? And if not that, then what? That's just one of the questions I'm posing today to author, international speaker and entrepreneur Christina Mand Lakiani. As a co-founder of Mind Valley, the global wellness platform she started with her then husband Vision Lakiani, Christina is every inch the success story. But in her new book, Becoming Flossom, she sets out to show how our struggles with identity, self-image and in her own case perfectionism can prevent us from finding lasting happiness while sharing practical advice for learning to like ourselves laws and all. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to discover how to age well, including the way we think about ourselves and our place in the world. So let's hear now from Christina Mandlachiani about her refreshing approach to life and making the most of every moment. Christina, welcome to the channel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. I mean, I know you've got a packed schedule at the moment, so um, thank you for sparing me the time. Um, I found becoming flossom both reassuring in recognising a lot of the things that can hold us back in life, uh, but there's also a lot of practical advice as well that I appreciated to help turn that around. And I mean, I think for many people who would look at you as someone who has achieved so much, including um, co-founding, an influential and high profile organization like Mind Valley, and they see a success story and that builds a kind of an illusion of a perfect life and everything's under control. What was the reality of your own life that brought you to write this book for other people? Well, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm a work in progress like everybody. So I can't say that I've made it. It's uh, every day you're making it uh, anew in a way. And I guess it's a succession of celebrations and occasionally breaking down in tears and <laughs> asking yourself, can I do that? But, uh, you know, it's not really the roller coaster, the emotional roller coaster that matters, but uh, rather, uh, why are you doing what you're doing? So with that book, uh, I find I find publishing it as the hardest, the hardest journey I've done. And I know people say, Say, oh, but you've already co-founded Mind Valley. That was mm -hmm. somehow always on the background and never, never stressed me too much. Uh, but with a the book, there are deadlines, there are expectations. So I realized that it's just a never-ending story. And the difference is, uh, are you, um, are you dragging yourself through your life and waiting for that day when you can finally rest? Or do you find meaning in what you're doing to the point where that emotional roller coaster is not really a hindrance or, or the reason for you to give up? And so my life has been like that and it is like that. But I guess the difference is that before uh, I was just uh, going uh, going with it. And now I, I'm, I'm constantly looking at it and analyzing what's going on. Is it is it OK? Is it normal or do I want to change something? It felt to me like in your book, it was almost about learning to be happy as a skill um, and you talk about um, you know that that sort of quest for perfectionism and and that if if people are presented with a choice between success and happiness for instance most of us would choose success believing that's what makes us happy but is that what you found I never I never questioned my happiness uh, until until I realized that it's actually uh, okay and it's not selfish to want to be happy uh, somehow I, I do not know if it's uh, just my upbringing of it's generally how we uh, contemporary society think about happiness but somehow it's a, not a serious goal or it's not considered a serious goal so I've been in personal growth for 20 year, years 20 so um Obviously, I've, I've uh, had a lot of interaction with people who want to make their life better. Mm -hmm. But when you talk to people, they usually talk about, you know, the the meaningful goals, the uh, the, the goals which uh, which are ambitious, which are professional. Uh, somehow we we. Um, we we think that professional uh, and and by professional I mean like something connected to your career, is is the serious type of thing and everything which is about your well being it's it's unimportant it's not serious it's selfish we are brought out to believe that some kind of accomplishments or tangible accomplishments are important yet your well being is unimportant. Mm. 
for whatever reason it is. So even even uh, right now, I, I mean, it's 2023. Uh, if I go, let's say, to one of our events and uh, I declare that my goal at the event is to just enjoy myself and have fun, <laughs> <laughs> usually the conversation ends there. I did an experiment at some point when I just started teaching about happiness. I said, I'm, I swear to you guys, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to set my happiness as a priority and I, I want to see the reaction of people. People think, oh, pff, you're just not a serious person. And it's so interesting how we have completely um, devalued the idea of happiness. And by happiness, I mean actually well-being more than the emotion of happiness. And emotion is a volatile thing. It's not a state. So I think we as a society, First of all, we uh, think happiness is unimportant. We misunderstand what it is. Uh, we completely disregard it. Um, and um, but if you ask yourself, what do you want for the per person that you love the most? I bet the first thing that you think of is happiness. Let's say yeah. if you have children, and I'm talking about to the, to the listeners right now, if you have children, and of course, you might want your children to uh, to be successful, to get a good education and whatnot. But in essence, we all want the people that we love to be just happy. Yeah. Well, I mean, so many parents, though, would set that up along the lines of in order to be happy, they need to have a good career, a good job. And so they'll be really pushing them forward with their education and so on. And I mean, have the, have the two got confused along the way? Uh, I mean, what even is success? If success is not happiness, you know, where where have you found the balance in your own life? And have you found in any way that success has actually thwarted your own happiness at times? Well, we do want to be successful for for many different reasons. One of them is, uh, of course, we want to be liked. And we think that if you're successful, you're going to be more liked. Mm -hmm. And if others like you, then uh, maybe you will dare to like yourself. <laughs> but that aside, I think the dilemma comes in a very simple, in a very, very simple phenomenon. We understand success because it's measurable and tangible. Mm -hmm. We understand how to achieve success, even if it's hard, we still get it. You have to work hard. You have to work on your weaknesses. You have to risk. What, what not? These are things that we understand. We can we understand how to put more hours into something. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that not necessarily is going to bring you success, but at least we kind of get the formula of success. When it comes to happiness, we don't understand it. And it's as simple as that. It's some ephemeral feeling, which is fleeting, which a lot of people tell us don't chase because if you do, you will not, you will never be happy. So, you know, if you have a choice between something which kind of feels good, but you don't understand what it is and something which maybe feels a little bit hard to achieve, but at least you absolutely understand what it is, then you're going yeah. to go for something which you understand because that may, gives you a, a, a fails feeling of certainty. But you are certain, you know, if nothing else helps, I'll put more hours, I'll work myself to death. But I'll I'll plow to that success, and uh, and happiness. Like, how can you work more to be happy? I thought the other thing that was really interesting in your book, where you're sort of talking about our identity um, and how we can attach almost attach happiness to that, and it just it struck me because I have a friend who um, she's just separated from her husband, and um, she doesn't know who she is anymore. She's lost all her sense of, of self-worth. You know, she's got kids that are uh, leaving for university. Um, she's she's like looking down a barrel of a gun of loneliness is how she feels. And um, I, I don't I don't know how to help her because she has she has attached herself so much to that identity that having having lost it, she doesn't know who she is anymore. Um, I mean, what what were your, would your advice, there must be lots of people in this situation, there's people who attach themselves to a job, you know, I mean, I've done that myself. And then you lose the job. And who even are you? You know, what, what's your advice to people in that position? Uh, you can attach yourself to being a wife of a successful man or, or to your job or to your bookmaking it, and, you know, what happens if it doesn't. Uh, you know, when it comes to your particular situation, I wouldn't give advice to your friend for one simple reason. Did she come to ask for us? You can't help her, whether you like it or not. Now, if if the people who are listening to this show are in this situation and they're listening to the show, then obviously they are already in the path, on the path mm -hmm. 
there. Of course, I can say a very, uh, very simple thing that you, your identity um, is not, strictly speaking, tied to your accomplishments. It's how you're used to seeing it or perceiving it, uh, because our uh, our thoughts also create tracks in our brain. And I'm of course uh, not 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 so saying it scientifically, but uh, they if you're used to thinking a certain thought, it becomes a pattern which mm-hmm. makes you feel comfortable, even if it's an unpleasant thought. But we are comfortable with something which we are familiar with. So if we keep thinking the same thoughts, then we get kind of comfortable with that, uh, maybe even painful thought. And that becomes our default mode. And we, you know, mm-hmm. go. To it. So very often our identity is formed out of best intentions. You know, I feel good with you. And mm-hmm. I feel I feel good about myself when I feel good with you. And then when you leave me, I suddenly feel so much pain mm-hmm. and my identity is kind of shattered but your identity is still there it's just this uh you know the the surface level has been shattered now to get to understand that your your self-worth is not tied to other people's opinions it is a journey and it's not something that i can you know unpuzzle or yeah. un- do in one in one simple advice uh but uh i think maybe maybe what might help you know since since patterns are a little hard to break especially the the invisible patterns you know the thought patterns something Mm. which happens in split second try to look at it from the different uh maybe from a different angle because there there you might not have a pattern because um you know your relationship with yourself has only to do with you and your uh, and yourself and no one else so whether whether I accept myself the way I am or I don't doesn't depend on other people's opinion. Let's maybe make a very simple example. If I wear shorts, which mm-hmm. maybe my 45 are not very appropriate. I'm 50 and I'm still wearing them. <laughs> but who decides if it's appropriate or not? Mm-hmm. You know, your opinion about yourself, if you think that you look, let's say, inappropriate or old or fat in those shorts, that's the opinion you're going to take out into the world and train the world to see you in that way. We very often don't realize that, that, but we train the world how they treat us. But if you allow this as a hypothesis, you will actually start noticing how it actually works. Think of somebody who is incredibly self-confident. Even if you doubt them, their self-confidence very often starts rubbing on you. And you start thinking maybe they are worth it. Or people who are incredibly, uh, you, you know, confused and doubt themselves. You know, that the research shows that when you go for a new job, you're not going to be paid what you're worth. You're going to be paid what you think you're worth, mm-hmm. yeah. which is absolutely logical. Because how is the person who's seeing you for the first time going to gauge how what you're actually worth? They, the only way for me to tell who you are is reading your own relationship to yourself. If you come to a, a job interview and you believe that you're worth it, that's the information that the guy who is interviewing you or the woman who is interviewing you is going to read and judge what you're worth. And I mean, when you talk about you're training the world, I go out and I'm really self-conscious and it's like, you know, I'll I'll still wear the shorts. Am I training them through the energy I'm giving out, through my attitude? How am I training them? Is it what they're reading from me and that somehow infects them with my lack of self-confidence? What does that mean to train them? Definitely. We, uh, you know, we learn about the world by mimicking it. Uh, it's called social contagion. That's how we learn about the world from the childhood. And then we keep doing that as we grow up. So how do you treat a person? You see how the tre- how the person thinks about themselves and that's how you treat them. It's It happens on such a subtle level that you don't even realize that this is what ha- is happening. And yes, mm-hmm. sometimes people create aversion in you by being a little bit too aggressive, a little bit too confident. But the question is not about whether you like their confidence or not, but you read their confidence and you know that whether you like them or not, you still have to consider with them being very assured of their own worth and value. We are surrounded by so many stimuli. We're mm-hmm. not always aware of them. And because our brain is actually filtering it out, we, we can focus on, on a limited uh, limited amount of, uh, you know, information. But uh, even intuition, you know, when science researches intuition, it's not as intangible as we think. There are a lot of little signs which our brain doesn't have time to register, but you react to them. Your body mm-hmm. reacts to them. So, yes, when you go out and you are conscious about how you look, the people will tell you exactly like that you are brave to come out in shorts like that. 
That's familiar. I once wore a pair of yellow trousers to work and the first comment I got from one of my colleagues was, you're brave wearing those. <laughs> I didn't feel so good about them for the rest of the day. Of course, there is a little bit of reflection as well. We can't we can't take it like a, as a, as a pure model because our interaction with the world has two aspects. One of them is how do you feel about yourself, and mm -hmm. you translate that um, energy. And of course, people are going to to read it and treat you uh, accordingly. But then there is also we also have to consider that people have their journeys, and mm -hmm. very often when somebody interacts with you, they are mirroring their own journey onto you. So, for example, if somebody comes and says, "Stop being so stressed." It mm -hmm. might be a reflection of their own uh, their own emotional uh, state at the moment, not about mm -hmm. you being stressed. They could have read something uh, which has nothing to do with stress for you and interpreted it through their own prism and through their own understanding. So those both factors kind of work. So when this person said that you're brave, it might be a reflection on their own insecurities. Yeah. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's hard to say. <laughs> Yes, I know. Absolutely. And I suppose that the best starting point is probably to be aware. You know, if you are, if you're feeling self-conscious, just being aware of the fact that you're self-conscious and then trying to change that a little can be the start of, of then breaking down those, those fears, can't it? But or just, you know, if you want to find courage, courage, the door to courage is kindness, surprisingly. Uh, and kindness towards yourself. So, for example, if you're conscious about those shorts, it doesn't. You you don't have to give yourself tough love, and you don't have to say go out in those shorts mm -hmm. because you have to. That's not how you work on your self confidence. That can actually shatter your self confidence if you do things that you're not ready for mm -hmm. to strengthen your self confidence. You can make it worse. So. Yeah how it works is that you know if you're self-conscious you can maybe take a moment and, and ask yourself i wonder why am i self-conscious do mm -hmm. i have to force myself is there it's like is there judgment on that you know i may uh, love and accept my body but still choose not to show certain parts of it mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with my confidence it has to uh, maybe something to do with my sense of aesthetics so you don't have to force yourself mm -hmm. to wear sexy clothes and go out and date if that doesn't feel good to you we we very often just like to blindly follow other people's advice without looking into the essence. So sometimes if we are told, you know, be brave, show yourself the way you are, wear that bikini, even if you don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not the solution. Maybe not for you. Um, I mean, it taps in. Um, and, and final question, because I, I know I know you are pressed for time. Um, I mean, I have a, a channel that explores how to age well, look and feel good for as long as we can. Um, and sometimes I worry that what I'm actually putting out there is it's wrong to have a wrinkle um, and we're scrutinising ourselves and picking over ourselves, you know. So it, it, it's really trying to get that balance, I think, between feeling good about yourself and keeping that vitality as we age um, and, and then not getting people to... Uh, not encouraging self-criticism and standing staring in the mirror all day and agonizing over every every line. I mean, you you mentioned there you're forty five. What does aging mean to you, and 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 where is that balance for you as you get older? How conscious are you going to be of your image and um, portraying a youthful image to to the world? Is is that important to you? So I don't care about portraying anything to anyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's that's just too much effort for me in my. I should have picked that up through the book. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm projecting now. But when it comes to aging, uh, I, I have to admit that it, it is a scary process for me. And mm -hmm. I'm, still, I'm still dancing with that realization because uh, five years ago, I decided I, I refuse to age. I don't want to age. But then I realized that maybe that's a damaging uh, self-talk as well because mm -hmm. what I don't want to age. I do age, even if it doesn't show outward. And sometimes you can put a decent layer of makeup and, and wear clothes which accentuate your assets and, you know, hide, hide all your flaws. And, and you can look really young. I mean, I've been surrounded by people 10, 15 years younger than myself for, for a long time. So I sometimes I'm not conscious of, you know, of, of the differences. Aging is not just about how you look. It's about how you feel. It's about how you, uh, how you interact with the world, how you take life, how you, uh, you know, how 
how you feel about yourself. It's all about aging. It's not just the looks. It's ridiculous to think that aging is just about the looks. And if that's all you equate aging to, then this is a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. We live in the time of agelessness. So many people look so much better than, you know, our peers, say, 20, 30 years ago. Our mothers, our grandmothers looked very different in our age. Not just look, they lived different. Yeah, they go, absolutely. You know, they didn't go to costume parties and 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 maybe ever wear bikinis. So I get it. We it's it's a new territory, and we are still stumbling. We as humanity are still stumbling with that because I hear, especially biohacking community, is obsessed with reversing mm. aging. But aging is not just your body. It's seeing the people that you love losing strength and dying. Kids growing up. That's about aging too. Mm. can we come to peace with time with uh you know with impermanence of life and think about aging in the essence and not just so be focused on the surface because surface is is skin deep it's easy to fool the world super easy to fool the world yeah just because you look young doesn't make you just because you hang with young people just because you date someone 20 years younger than yourself doesn't make you young it makes you the same age yes living a different lifestyle than your grandparents but you're still facing the time the flow of time and if you refuse to face it then it's going to be a shock <laughs> and you know i like what you say there we're just we're just figuring this out it's like social media with our kids it, it's uh, that suddenly come out of nowhere in the last 10 years and we're all just trying to figure that out as parents as well and as individuals when we're approaching age we're we're trying to we're trying to live a quality of life for as long as we can and we all have different ways of approaching that and there's, there's probably no right way or wrong way at this point in time comes back to kindness doesn't it yeah but you know i think it's really important to recognize that very often our attempts at cheating time mm. by looking extra young doing the young the things that young people do are just an escape from mm. a very simple thing that life is not forever and that's yeah. much more important than how you look. Yeah. So, you know, seize that moment and, and be with the people that you love right now. Yeah, make the most of today. Absolutely. Christina, thank you so much. I really, I, I would love to get you back actually on a quieter time and let's talk aging properly because that would be a fascinating one. But you look fabulous and um, best of luck with the book. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. I really hope we'll get to talk again. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Do let me know what resonated with you in the comments. And if you haven't already, then don't forget to hit subscribe for more interviews and inspiring videos like this one. And by liking this video, you help it reach a wider audience. So I'd appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up too. Thank you for being here today. I will link to Christina's book, Becoming Flossom, in the description, where you'll also find links to more discussions on the Honest channel. For now, take care and I'll see you next time.